Thank you very much, and thank you for reading The Economist. My, my children will eat. That's uh, the basic thing. So I'm going to begin with a few maps, if I can find the clicker, uh, just to set the scene. And I'm going to talk mostly about uh, how Europe, I think, is this extraordinary kind of cockpit of the populist forces uh, that have clearly been kind of building momentum for the last 10 years. I'm going to try and end on a hopeful note because the organizers said that we shouldn't send you away kind of in absolute <laughs> despair. And so there is, there is, I think, at least half an argument that Europe is perhaps the place where some of the solutions to fighting back the worst populist forces could be found. So I'll end with that. But I'm going to also mention just a bit uh, what has been happening here in America, not because we're all kind of mesmerized by Donald Trump, although we are all mesmerized by Donald Trump, but I just wanted to explain. Now, hopefully, this is going to keep. No, <coughs> perhaps if I, I'm going backwards, that's why. This is why you don't give the journalists the technology. Here you go. There we go. Now we're going forwards. So, just to set the scene with a few maps, and we're going to begin with an American map. So, we're even more divided than you think. So, this is a very familiar map to all of you. So, it's a divided country. Uh, and we're used to the idea of red and blue states. Now, this is the map that when you go and interview Donald Trump in the Oval Office, which I've done, uh, he has a copy of this on his desk. He really likes this map because this is the counties of the United States based on whether they went Trump or Clinton in 2016. And you can see that if you're Donald Trump, it looks like a very red country. And in fact, you can see that it's now perfectly possible if you get a good map to drive from one side of the country to the other without ever crossing a, state that a county that voted uh, for Hillary Clinton. But here is something that should give both parties pause. This is a map where each county has been given a height based on its population. So now you see that the map of America is basically a sea of flat red places, often with very few people. There are Republican counties in places like Kansas with 2,000 people in. Then there's Los Angeles County, which has a million people in. Now this is both sort of chastening for Republicans, because basically the Republicans have now become, if you like, the party of territory, the Democrats the party of people. But it's also very worrying for the Democrats, because they cannot claim to be a national party as long as their vote is clustered into these very kind of intensely concentrated uh, urban islands. Now let's look at some other maps uh, of some other recent elections, and I think you'll see that it's easy to kind of think as a political observer, I can't make sense of this. There's nothing to make sense of this. So think about the stories that people tell themselves in each country uh, that's had a recent election about what happened and why. So if you're a German, and we have an excellent German speaker on the next panel, you'll say, well, one of the big stories turns out to be how the East-West divide is still there. So Alternative for Deutschland, the, the, so the anti-immigrant party, uh, is very strong in the East. Uh, and Der Linke, which is the, sorry, the, the, the other one is Der Linke, which is basically the ex-communist party another extreme party, uh, which is again very strong in the Old East. So that's a kind of East-West story. Now let's look at the French election, the second uh, uh, round in the, in, the, uh, in the presidential election. Look at who Marine Le Pen uh, did best among. She did best among the 35 to 49-year-olds. So what can we say about them? We can say lots of things, but among other things, they're looking for jobs. Those are people still looking for jobs. They're in the workforce. Uh, you look at, uh, there's a massive education split. Uh, that Marine Le Pen, the far-right candidate, did much best. The top line, inferior back, is people who basically don't have a, a high school diploma. So it's less than a high school diploma. She got 45% of them. This is a map of Marine Le Pen's support. And on the other side, the gray map is the unemployment rate. Look how strong the correlation is. So if you're French, you're telling a story not about East-West Germany, you're telling a story about jobs. Now... You're also telling a story about optimism. This is basically what American political scientists call right track, wrong track. Uh, so they were asked, do you think the country's situation is going to get wetter or worse? You see red, se degradera, is like get worse, it's wrong track. 58% of people who think things are going to get worse voted for Marine Le Pen. So it's a job story, it's a kind of optimism story. Now we jump to the UK. Uh, this is the 2017 election. Look at that. So low education. So essentially the same group, people who, who didn't get a high school diploma effectively, 55% of them vote for the Conservative Party. Uh, and then you see that there's a kind of bourgeois Labour vote uh, on the right, 49% voting for uh, the far left candidate, Jeremy Corbyn. Now look at the age split. Massive, massive break among old people, also reflected 
in the Brexit agenda. Now, what can we say about people who are 70 years and over, who also are a very strong demographic uh, to vote to leave the European Union? They're not looking for jobs. So if you think Germany was a story about the East-West, France was a story about optimism, but also about jobs, Britain isn't so clearly a story about jobs because some of the most decisive moves to leave the European Union were led by people who are no longer looking for work. This is the Austrian presidential election we just had. Again, essentially a very regional story. So blue is the Freedom Party, the far-right party. They have a sort of regional, traditional stronghold in Styria and Carinthia down in the south. Uh, but you can see it's slightly more kind of fragmented when you go down to uh, municipal, uh, canton level, I think, that is. So... It's very easy as a political observer to look at that and say, oh my goodness, you know, it makes no sense at all. There are no patterns that I can discern from all of these results because uh, there's no consistent age split. There's no consistent uh, split about whether it's about jobs. Uh, it's not directly correlated with things like economic performance. On the age thing, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, Austria recently lowered its voting age to 16. And that was done by the, uh, the centre-left who thought that it was going to help them because they thought young people... The first election that allowed 16-year-olds to vote, they were one of the strongest voter groups for the far right. So if you're looking at all of these trends, you think, how do I possibly make sense of all of these trends? I've been working, uh, as, as, uh, as Carol said, I've been working for the last decade covering this populist rise. And it seems to me that there are certain ways to describe what is going on, this populist rage, uh, that make a certain sense. One of the things that's really striking, covering uh, first continental Europe, then Britain, now the United States, is how everyone has very different local complaints about why they're angry with their government. But they have very similar sort of lost amb ambitions. Remember I began the first slide, I, I talked about the politics of loss, trust, and control. What do I mean by the politics of loss? Every place I have reported for the last 10 years, people tell me they're worried their children won't do as well as they did. They're worried that the American dream or the European dream or the British dream, where if you work hard, play by the rules, you get a chance to get ahead. They're worried that that is being taken away from them. And then everyone has a local story. There's a joke that, you know, when, uh, when there's a political crisis... Uh, it's a bit like a fight in a Wild West bar. You basically, it's the chance to go and go up to the guy you've always disliked and punch them in the face. So when there's a major political or economic crisis, people are very inclined to blame the thing that they have already disliked for a long time and say that's the fault. So you go to uh, the continent of Europe and you ask them why uh, things are, you know, you go to the places that vote for Marine Le Pen where, say, coal and steel industries left uh, as globalization hit, and they will tell you a story about how the European Union is a vicious Anglo-Saxon ultra-liberal project which imposed globalization, and that's why the jobs left. You go to the same areas of the UK, and they will tell you that Margaret Thatcher hated the trade union so much that she deliberately chose to send the jobs overseas because she wouldn't bear being defied. You go to, and so that's a kind of anti-conservative story, you go to places like the Ardennes in Belgium where their coal and steel industry left at exactly the same time, and they had unified socialist government throughout that entire period. So you then go to the United States, and I, you know, I've spent the last five years, it's my second posting, so I spent nine years covering American politics. If I had a dollar for every Republican or conservative who had said to me at a rally, their central story of politics is that Democrats win elections, by giving free stuff on my dime to the lazy poor. That's basically the kind of the core complaint. And that's destroyed the work ethic of America, and therefore that's why the country kind of feels all wrong. You go to democratic rallies, and people will say that, uh, you know, the elites chose to send the jobs to China because they're greedy, and they weren't stopped. And that's what went wrong. And Romney uh, suffered very badly because Obama used exactly that argument to make Sir Romney into an avatar uh, for sort of footloose, heartless global elites. But here's the problem. Remember those maps, which don't tell a neat and tidy story. It's the same with those complaints. You're talking to people in countries with strong labor unions and weak labor unions, in countries with strong welfare safety nets and weak welfare safety nets, and they all have the same complaints, that the country doesn't feel as it should and that the people they dislike chose to do this to them. So how do you not kind of just throw up your hands and say, I don't understand this? Well, my theory, and it's only a partial theory, but I offer it to you, is that one way of describing what we're seeing is that rich world voters across the West believe that they should be protected 
against competition that they feel is unfair or unbearable. And that the elites, the politicians, the leaders are not giving them that protection. And that competition might come from machines. So that's a story that clearly hasn't ended yet. It might come from foreigners in their country, immigrants who they feel are competing with them unfairly. It might come from foreigners somewhere far away in China or through globalization. But they believe that they need to be protected against that competition that they feel is unfair or unbearable. The problem with that is that responsible mainstream politicians are paralyzed because if they give workers, voters, the protections against competition that the, vo that the voters want, they'll be erecting barriers that will tank the economy. They don't know how to give people the protection that they want, so they're, they're frozen in place. And that leaves a path for populists. That's the vacuum into which the populists rush. Because if you're a populist, you don't have to be responsible. You can say, this was done to you by the elites. They chose to do this to you because they don't like you, because they're looking after themselves, because they're self-dealing, because they're selfish. And the proof is, look how well they're doing. So they must be in on this. This must be a scheme that they designed to suit their own interests, because look how well they're doing when you're not doing well. And that's a very, very powerful message. Now, in the European context, I think this is playing out uh, in a way that also ties back to competition. Now, you, you saw the Economist cover that said that politics is no longer about left versus right in neat and tidy ways. It's about open versus closed. I think that's actually been visible for quite a while inside the European Union. So when I was working in Brussels uh, for five years, one of the sort of puzzles of trying to explain European Union politics is that the pan-European political parties that some pro-Europeans uh, proposed as the solution to the democratic deficit, they didn't really make a lot of sense. So you had a large pan-European party of European socialists, which took in all of the center-left social democratic parties from all of the EU countries. And then you had the European People's Party, which bizarrely wasn't the People's Party, it was the center-right conservatives, the Christian Democrats. But here was the problem. If you went and actually talked to Swedish social democrats who were members of the socialist group, they were far more f in favor of free trade and markets and the kind of things that The Economist stands for than a French conservative, let alone an Italian conservative or a Greek conservative. The lines did not neatly work in terms of left versus right. It wasn't also perfectly north-south. Uh, those lines didn't work. I finally came up with the, the, the frame that European politics, among other things, you can make a distinction about views of competition, that there are two very large camps in the European Union with views of competition. And one camp, broadly the Anglo-Saxon kind of economist reading uh, free market camp, thinks that competition is a bit like exercise. It keeps you fit. Sometimes it's hard work. Some people may get in injured by it, but in general, it's better for more people to be doing exercise than not, because that's what's going to help you run in the race. And there's countries like China, which are going to be running that race whether you like it or not. So you have no choice. But you take away competition, and it's, it's like a population that gets unfit and flabby. It's not going to help them. That's one view. You then have another view, which was broadly always kind of led by the French, which was that competition was at best a necessary evil and certainly something that you want to manage and you want to control and you want to restrain. I remember a, a kind of aha moment for me was uh, there was, a Euro some of you will remember, the European Constitution uh, that was then voted down in referendums in France, the Netherlands, and Ireland. Then it came back, because Europe being Europe, they don't take no for an answer, so they just basically chopped it up into pieces and stuffed it into a new sausage skin and called it the Lisbon Treaty and rammed it through without... Uh, really many more votes of the people. But there was, a, there was a European summit to approve the Lisbon Treaty, and Nicolas Sarkozy had just been elected president of France. He was a kind of soft nationalist, center-right, pro-business, kind of hyperactive uh, kind of guy. He came to this summit, just won a big victory. All eyes were on Sarko. What was he going to demand? And he had a demand that his country had voted against the Constitution, they were now going to accept the Lisbon Treaty, but something big had to change. There had to be a big concession. And one of the big concessions that he asked for was that in the preamble to the treaty, when it described what should be the central tasks 
of the European Union. The Constitution had language that said that one of the central tasks of the European Union is to promote free and undistorted competition. And Sarkozy said this is totally unacceptable. This has to come out of the treaty. Now, if you're a British free market liberal like me, and you see someone arguing against free and undistorted competition, you know, you're, how can that be the most provocative thing in the treaty? And luckily at that time, I was uh, teaching a couple of times a year at a French business school, Subteco, in Paris. And so I had a pool of clever, smart, French would-be business people. And so just about the same time as this summit, I was down in Paris uh, at uh, Subteco, ESPCP, and I said to these students, I said, you know, this phrase, uh, concurrence libre et non forcée, free and undistorted competition, is clearly, apparently, very provocative. Why? Let's play word association. What, to you, is the opposite of competition? And they said, without hesitation, that's easy, solidarity. And I said, hi, because you see, for me, the opposite of competition is a monopoly. And you see what a total kind of crossing of the philosophies. Now, I'm tempted, and there are people here who speak this as mother tongues, I think you can see clues to this even in, the, in, the, in European languages. So in English, we talk about fair and unfair competition. It's a legal principle. You can measure it with numbers, and you can lay a legal case based on it. The same term in European languages is loyal and disloyal competition. Concurrence loyale and déloyale, leal and desleal in Spanish, leale, deal, deleale in Italian. And I think in there there's a kind of clue that there's that kind of mountaintop town with three baker's shops, and one of the bakers lowers his prices one morning, and the other two say, whoa, whoa you know, we need to have a meeting of the guild, because you are, you are going to force us to lower our prices, and how are we going to make a living? You know, that, my friend, is disloyal competition to the guild of bakers. And I think that is, it's a perfectly intellectually respectable tradition, but it's a very different tradition from the Anglo-Saxon vision that competition is what keeps you fit because there are other bakers outside the walls of that town. And if the three bakers inside the town don't keep competitive, then someone else is going to come and eat their breakfast, I guess, rather than lunch. It's a baker. One of the things that's really interesting about covering uh, Donald Trump as a European journalist, but more than half our readers are American, uh, The Economist, is I go on a lot of radio and TV panel shows. And certainly at the beginning of the Trump era, uh, people would, there would come a moment where people would say, you know, maybe Donald Trump is sort of a bit of a Democrat because, you know, he's, he's not going to cut uh, Social Security. He doesn't want to uh, cut Medicare. He doesn't seem to be that fussed about debts and deficits. So maybe he's a bit of a Democrat as well as a bit of a Republican. And I would tend to say at that point, that's not right. If you're European, you recognize Donald Trump's program pretty clearly. It's not very mysterious. Now, it's true that in the American context, it doesn't fit neatly and tidily into uh, Democrat versus Republican. But in the European context, his program, which is anti-globalization, anti-free trade, authoritarian, uh, not very interested in human rights abroad, uh, nativist, uh, anti-Muslim, uh, law and order, and preserving generous benefits for our people, the right people, particularly old people, that's essentially not a million miles away from Marine Le Pen's program, or from Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, or the AFD in Germany. It's the European nationalist populist rights program. And so in some ways, Donald Trump, I think, is best understood as an exotic European import. He's a bit like a kind of BMW. <laughs> So if you're a European, you get what he's up to. Even more so, Steve Bannon, who I've met several times. He's a very interesting, thoughtful guy. But he is absolutely like a European kind of blood and soil nationalist. There was a fascinating interview early on uh, during the presidential campaign when Steve Bannon was still at Breitbart News. And he interviewed Donald Trump. And they were talking about uh, immigration policy, particularly legal immigration policy. And Trump at that stage, was not kind of fully on board with the, nat the nativist thing. And he said, well, you know, foreigners who come to American colleges and get PhDs in science degrees, we should give them a green card. Because, I mean, you know, we want those guys. They're good. They're smart guys. And Steve Bannon went, ah. <coughs> and Trump said, well, you don't like that? And Bannon said, well, you know, when you think about how half the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from, in, uh, from South Asia, 
which is actually not true, but that was what he said. And then he said, you know, a country is more than an economy. It's also a society. Now, I think that's not only profoundly wrong, it's immoral in my view, it's also profoundly un-American. That's a kind of blunt and soil view of what it is to be an American. America's great genius over the years has been that the stranger who comes to town with the best idea gets to set up and succeed. That's why you're such a successful country. Europe is the place that obsess about blood and soil and folk and people. And that's how you overtook us, by welcoming in the world's smartest people. So that's potentially, I think, a very dangerous uh, import. Now, within the European context, to end on a kind of European note and tee up the, the, the panel discussion, are there ways in which you see European governments wrestling with this populism which might point to the right and the wrong way uh, to tackle this attack by people offering irresponsible solutions? Well, I think you can see some more or less successful strategies at work. Now, one of the wrong ways to fight off populists, in my view, is what I've called in columns homeopathic politics, by which, so that if the doctrine of homeopathy, and I apologize to anyone who's a fan of homeopathy here because I'm not especially convinced, is that you take a dose of something, a very microscopic dose of something powerful, sometimes toxic, and that will trigger an immune response that cures people. Homeopathic politics, I believe, is where mainstream politicians who are frightened of a populist challenge say, if I give voters a tiny dose of a bad idea, then that will break their fever. That will be enough to keep them safe, but I won't have to do anything really damaging to the country. I think that's a disastrous mistake. I think you saw uh, successive French presidents have tried this with protectionism over the years. I think you saw David Cameron do it when he told the British public that net immigration into Britain needed to be reduced massively from the hundreds of thousands a year to tens of thousands a year, which was basically telling people that immigration is a bad thing. He then tries to go and hold a referendum on Europe, and he's taken free movement of people completely off the table as something he can defend, because he's already told people that free movement of people is on balance a bad thing. And so he was utterly unable to defend one of the central planks of the European project. It's one of the reasons why I think he lost. I think Hillary Clinton uh, denouncing TPP, which he'd early called the, the gold standard of uh, trade policies, was homeopathic politics. Here's the problem with homeopathic politics. Voters hear their leaders saying, you're right. You're right to want protectionism. You're right to think that immigrants are basically a bad thing for this country. But I'm too much of a coward to give you anything more than a tiny dose of it. And then you have someone coming along with a prescription strength bad idea. And of course they win. So how does, how does, uh, are there smarter ways of uh, defending populist, uh, fighting off populism? So one thing I think that's really interesting is Donald Trump, who I don't have a huge amount of time for, he has one very powerful insight, uh, which in the hands of a better man could have done great things. One of the great tragedies, I would say, of the Trump presidency is that he's not a better man because he had a very powerful insight, which was that it's not enough for aggregate incomes to be in reasonable shape. It's not enough for aggregate GDP growth to be in good shape. Uh, it's not enough for defenders of globalization to say there's now cheap goods in the shops and so on balance everyone is better off. That people need to feel useful. People need to feel respected. People need to feel that their view of the world is being heeded by people in power, that they're being listened to. People need to feel good. People need to feel like they're the, the, the good father, the good husband that is going out and providing for their family. And if you, if you see gigantic economic forces that reduce the economic and social value of, say, uh, white men with a high school diploma, it's not enough to scold them and to say, well, if you resent these forces, you're a bigot. You have to also understand, I think, that they grew up in a time where they were the breadwinner. They were the head of the household. That made them a good person. That made them a useful member of society. And now their economic value has collapsed. And just giving them money, so a universal basic income, which you see some people talking about, or welfare in the European context, it's not enough. People need to feel useful, and he did. Donald Trump got that. There's a, there's a better way uh, of trying to make people feel useful and heated. So part of the answer, and I'm very keen to go to questions too, 
So there's a guy called Frederick Reinfeldt, who used to be Prime Minister of Sweden. Uh, I had a lot of time for Frederick Reinfeldt. He was a kind of center-right guy, very pro-free trade, but also one of the early politicians to be kind of brave about uh, the refugee crisis that then cost him his job. He's now out of politics completely. But I remember asking him about why Sweden was so free trade, why Sweden had a particularly open view of globalization. And he said, well, it's partly geography. If you look on a map, we're at the right at the top of the corner of, uh, of Europe. No one comes through Sweden on, a, on the off chance. If we're not making stuff that people want, no one's going to come here. We have to be competitive. We have no choice but to be competitive. But in terms of how to soften the blows of globalization, he told a story. He said, if I see a ship sinking, so a company in trouble or an industry that's under you know, unbearable new competition, my instinct is to try and save the ship. It's to try and save the sailors, not the ship. So that means retraining for workers. You don't protect the job of today. You protect the worker uh, so that they can get the job of tomorrow. There was a fascinating example when I was in Sweden. Uh, General Motors owned a subsidiary Saab. You remember the kind of the weird cars that college professors drove? You had the tweed jacket with the pipe and the Saab. <laughs> now I guess you have a Subaru, but it was a Saab in the old days. And Saab went bust. Uh, and the Swedish government uh, did not bail it out. And it was a remarkable thing. I went to speak to the Swedish labor union for car workers, and I said, you're not calling for the government to bail out Saab. And they said, oh, it's a very badly run company, and uh, that's taxpayers' money. You, know, you don't want don't to mess with that. It's like, well, so you're the labor union. Wow. Because they had this view that competition was basically a, a good thing. In the British context, I'm very worried that we used to be that champion for that vision of competition, uh, but we're all over the place at the moment. You essentially, uh, we can talk more about Brexit if you like, but the short version is that the British people gave the British government a mandate for something that can't be delivered. What they said was, we want Britain to be open to business, to be as prosperous as ever, uh, but we don't want to have open immigration. So we want to be open to business with closed borders. That was the mandate, and we want it to be cost-free. That was the mandate that the British public, in their wisdom, handed to British uh, politicians, egged on by irresponsible British politicians, and that's an impossible mandate to deliver. But in the meantime, we're seeing a gigantic kind of uh, shifting where even conservative British politicians, the heirs to Margaret Thatcher, are now talking about industrial policy, uh, they're talking about subsidies for British factories to keep them open. They're really you know, challenging that very idea of whether they're open to competition. Angela Merkel, I think, is an interesting example of someone who is a very successful practitioner of the old politics. She's still basically a brilliant practitioner of the politics of left, right, center, traditional parties. And I think that she's squeezed one last victory out of the old politics this year, but in a kind of very weak way. Emmanuel Macron is a very interesting figure, because I think that Emmanuel Macron, he's addressing this central problem of, of populism, I think, which is that I think one of the single problems of the populist, na the largest problem of the populist nationalists we see is that they're not very interested in the fact that foreigners have politics too. So the single greatest problem of the Brexit vote is the British government believes that on the British side of the English Channel, it's a, you know, we have to listen to the rage of the voters and we have to close borders and we have to take all of these uh, you know, decisions which may not be great for the economy because the people have spoken and the democratic kind of will is so powerful that technocrats and, and business leaders just have to pipe down. But then you ask them why they think Brexit will be a success, and they say, oh, of course, on the German side of the channel, the head of C the CEO of Volkswagen will telephone Angela Merkel and say, do the Brits a good deal because we want to sell Volkswagens in the UK. So they'll need to give us essentially preferential access to the single market because they want to sell us stuff. So the democracy and the rage is on our side of the English channel, but apparently on the other side of the English channel, it's just pure technocracy. They don't have politics. I think Trump is extremely incurious about the fact that foreigners have politics too. Macron understands two very powerful things that Trump understands. He understands that thing about people needing to feel useful, people needing to, feel, people needing to be told stories about being good people, heroic people, narratives which make them heroes. Uh, Macron is very, very interested in that idea of narratives. We'll hear more at the next panel about what Macron is like. He's also very alive to the fact that foreigners have politics too. You know, the way that he's been talking to uh, particularly Angela Merkel, understanding that this needs to be a kind of French-German deal. He needs to bring in others too. So that's how I'm going to leave you with a kind of positive thought about Europe, which is 
Europe has a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. I think Europe started in the worst place that America in terms of views of competition. Uh, but at least the scale of Europe is such that you cannot for very long pretend that foreigners don't have politics too. That if one of the ways we're going to get out of this crisis is by trying to have more empathy for the politics of other countries, to understand that you can't just be kind of America first. You know, you can't, be, you can't get elected as a Germany first chancellor. It would terrify not just your own voters, but everyone else too. So Europe is, is wrestling with these forces. You've got different models. You've got, I think, the Brits making no sense at all. You've got the Catalans trying this version of kind of liberal nationalism that's somehow not frightening because it's within a European context, but that's really not working because you can see that Europe is still essentially based around nation states uh, and, and they're not willing to let the Catalans you know, break that up. Uh, you have the uh, Sebastian Kurz, as you saw earlier in Austria, whose plan is to try and co-opt the far right. He may bring the far right into his coalition uh, and see if he can kind of diminish them by giving them the responsibilities of governing. I think that's a very dangerous model myself. And then Macron, who in some ways is the kind of uh, Harry Potter to uh, Trump's Voldemort. You know, they're both playing the same... They're both in the same world of magic, if you like. Uh, magical politics about so, stories and heroes. Uh, but he's the kind of the good side, hopefully. Uh, maybe that will work. I think if you choose to stave off despair by waiting for France to reform, it's not always a safe bet. But, um, <laughs> but he's doing better than Britain. And that, you know, that costs me to say a Frenchman is doing better than Britain. But I'm, uh, I'm very keen to, to take your questions and, and happy to talk about any of these subjects. Thank you. David, thank you. Thank you, David. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Is this on? Okay. David, thank you very much. Um, we'll start. We'll jump right in. Uh, there are question cards in your notebooks as well. So if you have questions, feel free to write them down, and we have uh, people collecting them on the sides. So we'll start with some of an, an academic question. Um, so Lord Ismay, the first uh, NATO Secretary General, said that NATO really needed to, was, was built to keep, keep the Russians out, Germany down, and the US in, Europe. That all seems to be collapsing uh, now. Just your thoughts on NATO, is it still necessary today and the role that NATO plays? Yeah, NATO is uh, vital. I mean, so this goes to the core of um, a really interesting question about America and its role in foreign policy at the moment. You can make an optimistic and a pessimistic case, and they both have a lot of sense to them. So the optimistic case is actually NATO is still standing. And Trump went and sort of ranted and raved, but NATO still exists. He hasn't pulled out. Um, Article 5, the guarantee that an attack on one is an attack on all, still stands. There are still American troops uh, on heavy rotation in places like the Baltics and, and Poland. And actually, as ever with Trump, he hasn't really done that much. There's been a lot of talking, but he hasn't done that much. And you have people like Secretary Mattis, who I was in Asia with last week, who's you know perfectly conventional, grown-up guy who is totally committed to America's alliances. The pessimistic view is that even if NATO still stands, that Trump is raising the political costs for his allies of just doing the right normal thing. That by being overtly America first, uh, by being overtly all about America being a bit more selfish or a lot more selfish and a lot more transactional and not very interested in a rules-based order uh, in which all have a seat at the table, that, that just raises the costs of doing the right thing. And I'll tell you a story that I didn't think I was going to get to put in the paper, but I did. So I have a friend I've known for a long time who's in the government of a small to medium-sized European country. He comes to Washington on work about twice a year, and when he does, we have coffee. And the most recent time I saw him was shortly after the NATO summit. Remember the summit where Trump went and kind of browbeat them about uh, spending more than 2% of their GDP on defense spending and told them that he was, you know, he was very aggressive and you saw the others all looking kind of uh, pretty unimpressed and it was, it was a big story. It was in April or May, I think. So he comes to, to Washington. He said to me, you know, here's a story. The day after Donald Trump was elected in November 2016, the National Security Council of my country, we had, a, we had a meeting. Top of the agenda was, we're going to need to spend more like 
They're nowhere near 2% this country uh, on defense because Trump is the new president. An alliance with America is a keystone of our foreign policy and he's going to be on our backs. So the conversation was basically, where do we find this money? We haven't got the money. We're going to have to find the money. We're completely stuck. You know. Then the same National Security Council had a meeting after the NATO summit. And they said, we're home clear. Trump's an idiot. He offended Merkel. He offended Macron. Our public hates him. We're just going to ignore him for the next, you know, for as long as we can, because the pressure's off. Because we can just say, well, we're not going to spend money for Trump. And the public will cheer us. And so you can see that there's these kind of normative costs to having someone racing around the world saying everything is bilateral and everyone should be looking out for their own interests and everyone should be a nationalist. Now, the actual concrete costs, NATO still stands. But those normative costs, I think, will quite quickly start to erode a lot of those relationships. And you spoke a lot about populism and populist leaders. What happens when a populist leader is also an elite? So that's a really interesting question. I think, again, you know, we're talking about Europe. But, I mean, you know, Macron is... Uh, in some ways a kind of outsider candidate, but, you know, he'd served in the socialist administration of François Hollande as, as, uh, as a senior you know, finance official. He comes out of the, the world of, of merchant banking. I, I have no problem with the world of merchant banking. I'm from The Economist. But, you know, uh, to look at the Trump question, uh, there was a really interesting essay published just after last year's election by an American labor union uh, leader and I f wish I could remember his name. I think he was from Ohio. And his take was much more left-wing than mine, certainly much more anti-free trade than mine. But he said one really smart thing. He was saying, some of my colleagues don't get why our guys hated Mitt Romney because he was a rich guy in a kind of suit and a businessman, but they loved Donald Trump, who was a rich guy in a suit and a businessman. And he said, it's easy. The people that our guys hate are the credentialed guys, the managers, the guy in the corner office of the factory who, because he went to college, wears a necktie and sits down at work and then gets to come out and tell his guys that they've had too long of a cigarette break and to get back to work. And the, the workers, they hate that guy. They hate his guts. And he might even be their brother-in-law, but they hate his guts because he thinks that just because he's got this credential of a college degree and a necktie and an air conditioning unit and a desk, that he gets to boss them around all day. And Mitt Romney was that guy. Mitt Romney was their boss, the boss they didn't like. And Obama was really effective. If you remember those election ads over the summer of 2012, where he basically pounded his head in with those ads of people whose jobs had been offshored because of Bain Capital. He basically painted Mitt Romney as a kind of heartless, ruthless, globalist kind of capitalist before Mitt Romney uh, had been nominated and could spend money. Trump is not that guy. Trump is a working class guy with a billion dollars. He's them with a billion dollars. If they had a billion dollars, I'm quoting this essay now effectively, they would have a plane with their name on the side in gold letters. They'd have a new blonde every three years. They would have a McDonald's hamburger on a silver tray brought by a butler. That's, he's them with a billion dollars. And beyond that, because that's, you know, you run the risk of sounding snobbish, Trump speaks for them. It's, you know, one of the big puzzles in... in, in, in this moment of talking about, you know, how come an elitist gets away with being so-called populist leader. It's a bit like the discussion in Washington policy circles. Well, Trump got elected on this, this, and this promise, and yet my checklist doesn't have any ticks in the box. He hasn't done those things. How is he still doing fine with his base? And I think that the problem with that kind of analysis is that we're thinking about what politicians do, because that's the policy world. We think about what politicians do. But Trump's genius is to understand that we are ever more in a world not of what politicians do, but who they're for. And his base is absolutely confident that he is for them, that he sees the world the same way that they do, that of course it's common sense that refugees are dangerous and that they shouldn't be allowed in the country and you have to be crazy to let them in. Of course it would be safer to have a wall on the Mexican border. Of course it'd be a good idea to basically have protectionist tariffs against China. And he is a very powerful and wealthy and successful guy who agrees with them. And that's immensely empowering. It's validating. He's telling them, yeah, I could be a member of the elite if I wanted to be. I have all the money to be. I know these guys, but I agree with you.
because you, the common man, you have the common sense, not these so-called credentialed, over-educated experts who look down on you as a dimwit. And that is an immensely powerful version of the traditional populist message, kind of turbocharged by his personal success. Um, kind of shifting to, towards Europe and the rise of nationalism, uh, just parallels you see between that and the 1930s in Germany, and then to combine another, another question, um, what role, if any, does racism or anti-Semitism play into what you're seeing um, across Europe right now? So if you want to be optimistic, um, you know, it's a lot better than the 1930s. I remember writing a column, a Charlemagne column. I mean, not just because we don't have Hitler, because that's kind of a low bar. <laughs> but, um, but if you look at what built up to that. So I remember writing a Charlemagne column years ago, looking at the way that the European Union provided a kind of a structure which would limit, to some extent, some of the worst kind of nation, you know, nationalist sort of rows that we saw building up. Remember that in the 19, uh, before the 1930s, before the Great Depression, before the 28, 29, early 30s, you know, crash and Great Depression, Europe had essentially open borders. There was essentially no immigration law whatsoever. France is a fascinating case in point. They had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of foreign migrant workers, uh, Italians, Poles, uh, Czechs, Spaniards, working in places like coal mines and stuff. When the financial crisis bit and the depression uh, got really bad, there was a moment where the French sent troops to expel Polish coal miners by force. They marched them back over the border by force. There was a law passed to ban foreign-born lawyers and doctors in Paris, which was essentially a move against Jewish refugees who were felt to be competing with French doctors and lawyers uh, too much. In the 1930s, the Nordic nations had a pact among themselves not to impose protectionist barriers because they understood how bad that would be. But as the financial crisis bit and the depression bit ever deeper, there was one moment where Denmark had to nationalize cattle because farmers couldn't afford to feed their cows and the cows were dying. And once that happened, and once unemployment hit 45% in the Netherlands, you saw protectionist barriers rising. There was a period in the pre-war history of the Netherlands where they essentially suspended democracy uh, for a brief period and had a kind of national unity government and banned elections. I mean, that was a world without the structures of the European Union, uh, without the structures of NATO. Uh, it's a world that, frankly, hadn't been through World War II. And the great lesson of World War II led to NATO, the United Nations, to Geneva Convention, to uh, the European Union. The pessimistic view is, and you know, Minnesota is a, a great and heroic example of, of allowing in lots of refugees, and it's a great thing, and, it's, and people keep citing to me what a wonderful bonus it's been for a city like the Twin Cities uh, to have this new infusion of kind of energy and, and vibrance. But I do worry that things like the post-war agreements, like the Geneva Convention, they were just written in a world that was a lot less mobile, that if you said there was an open guarantee, a legal promise that anyone who could prove persecution on the following grounds gets to come and live in our country if they need to, that was not a promise that many people were going to come and cash like a check because the world was really immobile. It was really hard to move from Syria to Germany. Uh, there, were, you know, there was the Iron Curtain. There were all, it was just a less mobile world. It's now a really mobile world. And I worry that... Any time I hear a conventional politician saying, well, we can't have a debate about how much public consent there is for this level of mobility because the Geneva Convention sets out what we must do. You know, I, I love and admire the Geneva Convention, but my experience of covering politics for the last 20 years is when the gap between what the law says on paper and what the public will tolerate gets too big, you have a crisis. And into that crisis come people like Donald Trump or the you know, the far right in, in Europe. Um, looking at Brexit, a question here as there's Last recent week. investigations into, uh, into Russia and potential influence in the Brexit uh, process, could there be a revote based on the findings of any investigation? So it is true that one of the big backers and one of the nastiest backers of one of the nastiest anti-Europe campaigns during Brexit, this guy called Aaron Banks, He's a nasty kind of nationalist. He said all kinds of vile things about sort of Muslims. Uh, he said he had a ton of money because he had an insurance company. There's been some interesting 
reporting done recently by the Financial Times, among others, that his company just isn't that successful. He just doesn't have that much money, and yet he was able to write very large checks, £10 million a time, uh, to the Leave campaign. It is the case, and we don't want to start getting into <coughs> scapegoating on national stereotypes, that he is married to a Russian woman. And it is the case that his, ex, his current wife was previously married to a Russian who was expelled for being an intelligence officer. And so shortly after divorcing her intelligence officer husband, she married Aaron Banks, and he suddenly had lots of money. So it is true. So the Electoral Commission in the UK is now investigating this. That in itself is not enough to undo what's happening. The bigger question, I think, that's being asked is, is there a chance that Brexit won't happen? I mean, I've given up making predictions about my own country because uh, it's gone nuts. But <laughs> here's the thing that is really hard, is that Brexit is now really inseparable from a debate about immigration and open borders. And I don't know how to undo Brexit, to say we made a mistake, we're going to go back and remain fully a member of the European Union. You would have to accept that Europe's open borders remained the rule of the land, the law of the land. And I just don't know. You know, if the thing that would get us back into Europe was a sort of technical concession about tariffs, you could imagine that happening. But my kind of gut instinct is that to go to the sort of 52% or the 51% that voted to leave and cram open borders, continued open borders, back down their throats, I just, I don't know, it just strikes me that, that that is really, really hard. But remember what I said about the, the problem the British government faces right now is they were given an unambiguous mandate to do something impossible and to have a cost-free Brexit. And that isn't, you know, it isn't going to happen. And... Theresa May, you know, I'm no fan of Theresa May's, but to her credit, she's more honest than the Brexiteers. I mean, she said after the vote, I hear you, you have voted uh, in part about closing the borders, and so I'm going to deliver that, and by the way, it's going to cost us, because we're going to have to leave the single market. So she, in some ways, confronted British voters with the logic of what they had just done, and they didn't like it. But, I don't know, yeah, I, it... God knows. I mean, there's a majority in Parliament of people who know it's a disaster, but it crosses all the party lines. There isn't one party that believes that. And so you then get into, you know, if you're a Labour MP, do you, do you care more about winning the next election? So maybe you don't want to help the Tories out of the hole they've dug for themselves? You know, there's all that kind of stuff. It's, it's yeah, my country has lost its mind. What can I say? <laughs> There's a, a question here on, on, on female leaders, so whether it's Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May, Angela Merkel, uh, Europe has had women heads of state, the U.S. hasn't. I'm just curious your thoughts on that and what, what just your thoughts on, on having uh, women leaders in particular in the U.S. So, I mean, Angela Merkel is, the fact that she is a woman is not at all irrelevant. Um, she is very brilliant at signaling very subtly that she is surrounded by uh, ridiculous men um, and that, uh, that she, you know, she's trying to deal with them the best she can, and, you know, she's very good at, at, at signaling that. Um, Theresa May less so, I guess. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I've heard her say some very funny things, but they were all what the Germans call unter drei, which means I can't tell you she said them. So there's one thing she did say during European summit. She had all the German correspondents to her hotel and Sarkozy had been kind of strutting around and, and doing his thing. And someone said, you know, how, how's your relations with, uh, with uh, President Sarkozy, uh, Chancellor? And she said, I think that um, Mr. Sarkozy thinks I'm the most boring person he's ever met. <laughs> it was kind of... <laughs> somewhere in there, there was a kind of brilliant, uh, brilliant tweak. But uh, I'm very reluctant to, because, you know, I have a daughter who I keep telling her that she can do anything that men can do. I'm very uncomfortable when I start reading brilliant pieces saying women are somehow better at government than men because they're more empathetic. Because, you know, you don't get to play that game each way. You know, either I tell my daughter that women are just as good as men at everything they do, but then I'm very uncomfortable about the argument that women are better than men at these things. Because, you know, I, that's not what I tell my daughter. I tell her she can be... It was, I went on a plane the other day with my daughter, and there was a pilot came out of the cockpit. She was a woman pilot. My daughter's 13. And I said, look, look, a woman pilot. And she went, yeah. <laughs> it's about, it about 
15 questions on Russia, and so I'll just pick uh, 14 of them. Um, <laughs> so everything, just, just the role that Russian is playing in the, e, in the EU, both um, uh, politically, their influence, economically, um, and then possibly the role of Russia um, in the U.S. election and just your own observations in that. I'll let you kind of pick and choose, but if you just want to wax eloquently on Russia for a while. So Russia's role in the European Union has always been that of a kind of spoiler, and it's changed. So when uh, we had the very brilliant earlier talk about German reunification, you know, the big tension at that time was you had people like uh, François Mitterrand, the then president of France, who did not want to reunify Germany, and he had this proposal uh, where you would have a kind of a larger outer circle of association and that the Russians would be allowed to join that because he did not want enlargement to include all the Eastern European countries. But there was a fascinating meeting in Prague and Václav Havel, who of course had tremendous moral authority as this kind of, for the high school kids here, you may or may not know, he was this dissident playwright, political prisoner who then became the first elected president of the free uh, Czechoslovakia, then Czech Republic when they divided. He had this extraordinary moral authority. You know, this guy had left his prison cell to become president. It was an amazing thing. And so there was a, there was a meeting in Prague where Mitterrand was advising that, you know, we should have this outer club where countries like the Poles and the Czechs went in with Russia. And Hull went, we did not spend decades behind the Iron Curtain to be stuck in a kind of second-class club with the Russians. That's not going to fly. And so then those Eastern European former Warsaw Pact countries came into the European Union. That was a huge win, by the way, for that pro-competition camp that used to be led by the British. It was partly the British encouraged Eastern European enlargement because they wanted to create a broader, not deeper European Union. They wanted to resist a kind of United States of Europe. They wanted to keep it at a kind of intergovernmental level. But it was also brilliantly about bringing globalization inside the boundaries of the single market. So that if your fear was, say, a French government that wanted to have protectionist tariffs to try and keep cheap labor out of Europe, you brought the cheap labor inside Europe so that Europe became a kind of economic unit that, that contained a kind of a world in and of itself. That was a huge victory. So that was the earlier role of Russia. Very briefly, the, the, the new role is, is really one of wrecker. It's a kind of nationalist wrecker. You see how uh, there's hard evidence that the uh, French National Front received bank loans from Russian banks. Uh, there is uh, some evidence that the German uh, far right and far left get soft money from uh, the Germans, uh, from the Russians. The Russians have been funding anti-fracking anti -fracking environmental groups in Germany because uh, they want to maintain the markets for Russian gas. But it's been a kind of role of, of spoiler, uh, sort of disruptor, you know, just trying to kind of stir up as much trouble as they can. In the American context, um, the thing that I find so shocking about the Russia investigation, I cover the Russia investigation for The Economist at the moment, it's one of my things, it's very easy to just go, this is so complicated I can't explain it. This is such a hall of mirrors that I can't explain it. But actually there's something simple going on. When you hear Democrats saying, the real villain to keep your eyes on is Donald Trump, and you hear Republicans and Fox News saying, no, 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 the real villain to keep your eyes on is Hillary Clinton. We should be talking about Hillary Clinton. The real villain is Russia. Russia attacked American democracy. And any politician who doesn't take that as the single most important fact is not operating in good faith. They're being a partisan. This country was attacked by a hostile foreign power. So any politician who doesn't start there, be suspicious of them. We'll do, we'll do one, one last question. And Back to the message of hope to the 70 plus high school students here today. What would you give them just to think as they look towards the future, as they prepare for the rest of their lives, um, taking this opportunity just to share a message, hopefully of hope, but your call. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it is, um, look, it's, I, mean, I have teenagers myself. It's a scary time to, to be kind of leaving school, going to college and stuff. But it's also an unbelievably, uh, Amazing time, you know. You have information in your smartphone that people like me had to schlep over to the university library and spend, you know, all day looking up. You have, if you want it, access to, you know, instant information about everything. Uh, health, you know, antibiotics, 
you look at any chart of life expectancy from the dawn of human time to the birth of antibiotics in the Second World War era and just goes off a chart, you know, half the people in this room would be dead by now without antibiotics. You know, I had appendicitis when I was at school. I'd be dead because there weren't antibiotics, but I'm not because there's antibiotics. There's a minor, you know, inconvenience. That's an amazing thing. You're also America's best hope. One of America's and I know it's soppy, you know, old farts like me say, young people, you know, you're our hope. But really, <laughs> to get crunchy and economic, you look at the median age of rich Western countries. Germany, by mid-century, its median age is going to go to something like 46. That's way too old. They need immigration to get in with it, but, you know, that's way too old. Uh, you take away uh, non-white uh, young people out of this country, and this country has a median age like Italy with all of the kind of pension and kind of welfare crises. You add back in all the young people uh, who are non-white, who come from kind of diversity. This is a very young country. So one of the things that's driving Trump, I'm sure, historians will look back and they'll talk about the arrival of China, globalization, automation. There's also a demographic story that from the time of George Washington as president to the time that Ronald Reagan was elected president, this country was never less than 80% whites of European descent. Now, there were sometimes wrinkles because, you know, some whites would be considered not as white as others because we had, you know, anti-Catholic discrimination, anti-Irish discrimination, but basically that was the story. After the, big, after the big immigration law change in 65, that changed very rapidly. We're now at two-thirds whites of European descent. Uh, by mid-century, it's going to go to about half whites of European descent. A lot of that driven by Hispanics. Hispanics, when you see someone like Donald Trump saying build a wall and you see voters cheering that because they imagine maybe that means, you know, they won't get, you know, they won't see so many sort of uh, Mexican restaurants on their street. They won't, they won't get, you know, Spanish when they dial City Hall and it says dial one for English, two for Spanish and they hate that. Here's the thing, it's too late. It's too late. Nine out of ten Hispanics in this country under the age of 18 are U.S. born citizens. It's done. They're here. And a million of them turn 18 every year and eligible to vote. So they're going to have tremendous power. Uh, so this country is younger than its rivals. It's more energetic than its rivals. It's more diverse than its rivals. That's, I think, a fantastic thing. I think that's a great strength. America is still the country where the stranger who arrives in town with the best idea gets to win. I envy you that. I'm proud that my kids have American passports. They were born in D.C. That's a great thing. We mustn't let go of it. You mustn't let go of it. And you, the high school kids, you're going to be the ones who teach us old people that we're being foolish. Lead us out. Thank you very much. Thank you.